are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good evening, lovely people, and welcome along once more to The Neil Oliver Show on GB News TV, online and on radio. This week, I will be focusing on the subject of food and nutrition. I'll be asking what we are eating and whether it's good for us and what could we be doing to live better, healthier lives. I'll be speaking to comedian Lewis Schaefer who found a mostly raw meat and egg diet to be the best kind in order to help him combat a series of medical problems. I'll also be talking to PETA, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, who think we would be better advised to eat meat produced in laboratories. Plus, plenty of discussion with my panellist, journalist and presenter Jasmine Bertels. But first, an update on the latest news headlines. Hi there, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Iran risks provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation, a warning from world leaders following last night's attack on Israel. G7 leaders, including Lord Cameron, have been meeting to discuss the crisis in the Middle East. They've condemned Iran launching hundreds of missiles and have reaffirmed their commitment to Israel's security. The Israeli War Cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran when the time is right, describing the Islamic Republic as the greatest threat to regional stability and world order. Iran, meanwhile, says the, it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. However, President Biden has warned his Israeli counterpart that the US will not take part in any retaliatory strikes, and White House spokesman John Kirby says Israel must decide on the next step. We need to see what the War Cabinet decides in terms of uh, the, whatever next step they want to pursue, and that's a sovereign decision, of course, that our Israeli counterparts have to make. I will just say this. President Biden, since the beginning of this conflict, has worked very hard to keep this from becoming a broader regional war. Earlier, Rishi Sunak confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles in what he's described as a dangerous escalation in tension. Uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy is urging the government to issue sanctions against Iran's Revolutionary National Guard. This highlights once again the extreme danger of the IRGC and the Iranian Guard. Uh, we have said that we think that it should be prescribed and it is for the government to come forward with new plans to prescribe them and to deal with this issue of state actors that would behave in this appalling way that wreaks terror on a wider community. 
More than 120,000 have crossed the English Channel by small boat since 2018. 219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than the same period last year. Labour's Shadow Immigration Minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone and says Britain must strengthen its border security. Meanwhile, a cabinet minister has insisted the government's Rwanda plan is on track, with flights due to take off within weeks. Health Secretary Victoria Atkins says the Home Office is ready to go, despite the troubled bill still making its way through Parliament. No airlines been named to transport the asylum seekers. A Rwanda's state-owned carrier has turned down a request. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said the flights would take off by spring, although no date has been set. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative's been dubbed Ranim's Law after 22-year-old Ranim Uda, who was killed by her former partner just 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of an emergency. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. The knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney yesterday advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but he hadn't been arrested or charged before yesterday's attack. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family, in a statement, have uh, praised the police officer who shot and killed him by saying she was only doing her job. And the new poll suggests Hamza Yusuf's popularity amongst SNP voters has fallen sharply. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7% among those who voted for the Scottish National Party in 2019. His approval with the general public also dropped to levels similar to his Conservative rivals. It comes after the introduction of a new hate law. Hate crime law prompted more than 7,000 complaints in its first week. More on all of our stories uh, on our website. You can get more by scanning the QR code on your screen too for GB News Alerts. Now it's time for Neil Oliver. say you are what you eat. If that's true, then a whole lot of people in this country and across the Western world are built out of strange ingredients, all manner of stuff consumed by billions of people every day, but that few, if paying attention, would recognise as food, by which I mean natural whole food, because it's not food, not in the natural sense, at least. If you are what you eat, then most are made of ingredients they couldn't name, things that didn't grow in fields, that never had a heartbeat, that never walked, swam or flew. Just as we build our bodies from the food we eat, so we build our understanding of the world from other things we take in. Information, in the form of things we read, things we see, things we're told by those we trust. If too many have had their stomachs filled with God knows what, building their bodies with rubbish for the most part, waste materials from industrial processes, chemical cocktails cooked to taste like something they're not, things never intended to be eaten by man or beast, then at least as many more have had their heads filled to bursting too with more fakery, toxic fakery, confected, concocted nonsense made palatable with more artificial flavouring. I'm minded to say doctored, Doctored, meaning to falsify, to disguise, to adulterate. An interesting word all on its own, but I digress. Instead of eating real whole food, too many eat fake food now. Things that didn't exist in any form at all until the last hundred years or so. Things made of ingredients doctored until human beings can be persuaded to swallow them and keep them down. And at the same time, rather than building an understanding of the world as it really is, too many are leaving the truth out of their lives entirely and swallowing lies instead. Lies doctored until they pass for something wholesome. Part of the truth that's missing from too many diets 
is that the swallowing of fake food and lies is nothing new, that people have been drinking the Kool-Aid for real and metaphorically for a long time. The first entirely synthetic, wholly fake food was coal butter, which is exactly what it sounds like, exactly as it ought to have said on the tin, but didn't, of course. An edible sludge made from coal and dyed yellow so it could be passed off as something a human being might eat. Coal butter was whipped up by a German food chemist Arthur Imhausen. During the Second World War, Nazi Germany needed to produce as much food and fuel as possible from within its own borders. From its huge reserves of low-quality coal called lignite, a way was found to make liquid fuel and also explosives, vital in wartime, obviously, as well as soap. Imhausen took the same raw material used to make the soap, being what we know as paraffin wax, and found a way to make it into a fat that could be dyed and flavoured until it might be passed off as a kind of butter edible by human beings. The companies that grew fat from the innovations like all that fuel, soap and butter included IG Farben, once the largest chemical and pharmaceutical company in the world. During the 1940s, IG Farben tested that butter on thousands of souls from concentration camps like Auschwitz. Data found after the war, the result of testing that was not made public at the time, revealed prolonged consumption of coal butter led to kidney disease. Dogs wouldn't touch the stuff. But since it was mostly to be given to U-boat crews, men with life expectancies in wartime of just a couple of months, no one was much bothered about the long-term effects of them eating fake butter. A subsidiary of IG Farben supplied the Zyklon B poison gas used to murder more than a million Jewish people in Auschwitz. The artificial sweetener we know as saccharin is another product made a hundred years ago from more coal. You are what you eat, remember? This is what big government and big business thinks of the likes of you and me. At least Marie Antoinette is supposed to have wanted the poor folk to eat not coal but cake. Let them hear lies is also nearer the mark. Tell them anything our governments clearly think and they'll swallow it right down. For as long as I can remember, we've been being frightened away from the good stuff, which is to say the truth and also healthy food. I'm of the vintage that grew up being sold the low-fat lifestyle, low-fat spreads instead of butter. Remember the Nazis and all that coal made yellow and spreadable. Spongy white bread that lasts for days without going stale. The insistence that eggs are bad news, best avoided. Go low fat and high carb, and always more and more ultra processed gunk for reheating in the microwave. On and on and on, leaving out the good stuff and replacing it with pap and gruel. Cereals were food for livestock until farmers in the US had a glut of the stuff year on year in the early 20th century, in the years before the dust bowl of the grapes of wrath ravaged the farmland anyway. But what to do with all that surplus cereal? way more than the livestock herds required. And then along came the breakfast cereal industry and the notion that while meat and fat stimulated unwholesome and unwanted lusts and desires, cereals would dampen all that down and create a more passive, peaceable, lustless population and the rest of the cattle cake repurposed for the poor. As well as a diet of cereal and low-fat fake butter and the rest, it has been a diet of lies about health and so much more. Vegetable is a word that makes us think healthy thoughts, and so vegetable oils sound like a healthy alternative to animal fats like real butter, tallow and lard. But vegetable oils, canola oil, sunflower oil, palm oil and the rest, started life as cheap lubricants for farm machinery, rancid in their raw state, foul-smelling and as far from appetising as it's possible to get. It was only the advent of processes by which those industrial byproducts might be clarified, made palatable, that they could be bottled and then set on supermarket shelves as fit for human consumption. For years we've been bombarded with claims that veganism will save the world. There's nothing green about that agenda. Notions like flying an avocado halfway around the world rather than eating something grown in a field up the road, somehow promising a brighter future. And have you had a look at the lists of ingredients on so-called plant-based foods? Well, the ingredients for a decent beef burger are, well, beef and maybe some salt and pepper. The ingredients for a plant-based burger offering read more like an A to Z for an explosive chemistry experiment. Most recently, we've had the spectre of insects for protein, and so a future of great barns filled with critters bred by the billions for rendering into yet more burgers utterly devoid of beef. 
Swarms of locusts, hothoused, what could possibly go wrong? And then the promise of lab-grown meat, a Frankenstein creation in my opinion, animal cells resultant from a biopsy harvested from living tissue and then coddled in a nutrient bath until fibres form that mimic the texture of flesh. I say this comes from a place of contempt, from a contemptuous view of our species held by a powerful wealthy few that fake and false is good enough for the likes of us. Everything else has been made so expensive, all but out of reach, rent, energy, the other stuff of life, that now in the West of all places, the so-called developed West of Britain and the US, the mass of the populations can afford to spend no more than 10% of their incomes, half that amount if possible, on the food they might put inside their bodies, inside the bodies of their children. Everything else is almost too expensive to buy, but life itself is as cheap as chips, chips deep fried in oil, little better than toxic waste. And all the while we're fed this crap, we receive a serving of lies on the side. All the nonsense about the so-called pandemic, about the safety and efficacy of the jabs, about the war in Ukraine, about the climate, about the Middle East, all that fakery and falsehood. Farmers across the world are fighting a land grab, a state-sponsored effort to force them off their fields so those fields might be repurposed for who knows what, but certainly not for growing wholesome food. Bill Gates, no scientist he, no doctor, but influencing the health care of billions on account only of his wealth, is now the largest private landowner in the US, more than a quarter of a million acres and counting, and he's no farmer either. In the UK, it will shortly be illegal to harbour so much as a single fugitive chicken in your back garden for meat and eggs or just as pets, unless each is registered with the state. I say the relentless push behind this move and the rest of the war on agriculture is to widen the already yawning chasm between people and their understanding of healthy food, never mind the ability to actually access it. And that's before the sinister threat of mRNA jabs for livestock and other foods and more Frankenstein sprays to extend the shelf life of everything else. You are what you eat and you're also what you understand. I've come to understand that nothing in recent times is about public health, if by that you mean an intention to keep people healthy. The last thing people needed during the times of a respiratory illness was to be shut indoors, barred from keeping fit, gyms closed while the fast food outlets remained open. Never a word about healthy food, far less the benefits of supplements as cheap and readily available as vitamin D, proven to help keep people well in the face of all ills. I say the preferred option of the state is a population made fat and sick by poor food and unhealthy lifestyles and then propped up by fabulously expensive drugs, drugs of unproven and uncertain safety from Big Pharma. The lies are everywhere. Liars lie about everything after all. The snake oil salesmen are everywhere. This week I watched so-called Foreign Secretary David Cameron and US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken address a press conference furrowed brows, hands clasped, I watched their lips moving. Cameron actually described Ukraine as value for money, an investment that had not cost the life of a single US serviceman, somehow forgetting the half a million dead Ukrainian men and boys. Neither would commit to ending arms sales to Israel. Cameron talked about more money for NATO as a 75th birthday present. Kerching, kerching. Here's the thing, if it's not the vegetable oils and the lab meat and the rest of the fake food and the clamp down on healthy living that's made you and yours sick these years past, then the lies from those in positions of authority must surely make your gorge rise. Pass the sick bag. I'm joined this week by journalist, presenter and friend, Jasmine Bertels. Hi, Jasmine. Hello there. Thanks for being here. I, I don't know about you, but I, I look out now at the, at the, at the people around me mm -hmm. and they don't look well. No. In a way that I, I was never previously aware of. Do you, do you sense the same? Yeah, well, I know what you mean, but, you know, like you, I was brought up um, with, with the, the low-fat diet, etc. I mean, when I, was, um, when I was a child, we had a lot of food from the garden. Um, my mum cooked from raw and all that. But... We also had um, cakes made with margarine. We had quite a lot of margarine around. Ate butter, but a lot of margarine. Angel Delight, goodness knows what. I mean, that's pure chemicals, you know, yep. let's be honest. Um, fish paste, meat paste, you know, there was all sorts of rubbish. And I do remember meeting some Americans and thinking they looked a lot healthier than we did. But I agree that right now we have a level of, for example, obesity that was not 
not seen for a moment where, when I was growing up. Um, I mean, really only in the last, I guess, 30 years. And, and there's a kind of a, it's a pallor. Yes, yes. About people. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're right. You know, people grossly overweight are, are now everywhere, everywhere where they used yeah. to be, you know, eye-catchingly rare mm, mm. In my, within my lifetime. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. But there's a kind of a, a greyness. Yes. A, a moistness, I don't know, that the... people just in increasing numbers yes. look careworn well, and yes. anxious and just not well. And I think you're right to, to mix the, the actual food and the, the lies that we are, as you say, swallowing, because much of it is mental. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about all sorts of different diets, I know. Mm. And I've been very interested to hear people who are absolutely determined and absolutely 100% convinced that their diet is the one. Mm. And that many of them are diametrically opposed, you know, veganism and, you know, meat only, all of that. Um, and, and you do find quite often that, that those who are completely convinced um, do look a bit more healthy than those who, who aren't convinced. Don't you think uh, whether people do decide and however they go about deciding whether they'll be vegan or, or they'll only eat meat or, or some mm. variation in between, that it's the very act of engagement mm. that probably is making a big part of contributing to their being better yes, in every true. way because they're switched on, mm. paying attention yes. and, and, and thinking and acting positively rather than just being on the receiving end of whatever they're given. Yes, and, and as you say, being on the receiving end, this sort of passivity, this uh, sense of helplessness that, that we've had, I think, for years. I mean, you, you mentioned the cold butter, which I'd never heard of. Um, but also, in, in the Victorian times, um, apparently Victorian bakers would, would put sawdust in the bread <sighs> to, you know, as you do. I mean, wh why wouldn't you? At but, least sawdust oh. is a natural product. Yes, well, yes, there is that. <laughs> I think that's probably what they said. It's a natural product, uh. whatever. And, and that contributed to child mortality, apparently, in certain areas. Yeah. So, you know, it's happened all the time, but it's happening, I think, on an industrial scale now. We're finding everything's got chemicals in. There was a piece in the, the mail just recently saying that um, strawberries are the worst for, for having all sorts of long-term chemicals in them. And I love strawberries. And, you know, it's not even uh, manufactured. This is strawberries. What I want to get to across the next, uh, you know, hour or couple of hours is... As whether or not there's any kind of uh, intent, mm. I have begun to wonder yeah. if, a, if a sick, overweight, weakened population and also miseducated and all of the rest mm. of it mm. isn't simply easier to deal with and that you've got constant profit. I mean, a, a patient cured is a customer lost. Yes, it is. And if I put my, my money hat on, as you know, I'm a financial journalist, something I talk about a lot now is pensions and the very shaky future of them because, as you know, we and, and all the Western countries have massively overprinted money. We are hugely indebted and a large amount of that is to pay the state pensions. Um, and, you know, the, there, are, there are a few ways that you can combat the state pension problem. You can either do what we are doing now and just make it that you have to be older and older and older to get mm -hmm. the state pension. Um, or you have a lot of immigration because it's the, the working immigrants um, who are paying, um, who would help to pay for the state pension. Or you just kill them off. Just kill, kill off the old people. I know where my money is. Mm. That's a bet. Yeah. <laughs> it's a break already, after which I'll be joined by a biochemical engineer to talk about whether there are drawbacks to eating lab-grown meat. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go away. in Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. Mark White was saying there, Sue, that he thinks it's getting worse. And you, again, you were nodding along to that. You've, you've seen this over decades. Situation is sprawling along the coast, more people, yes. and the danger is ramping up. Definitely, um, because the, the numbers and the money is... It's run like a military operation. Mm. I mean, I've been told that by the National Crime Agency and I don't need to be told it by them to know it. It is meticulous because there's so much money involved. So they're, they're marshalling migrants here, the gangs, they're controlling the gangs, and there will be a Mr a Kingpin, mm. you know, in some city far away in Erbil or 
even in Paris or in Brussels, who never goes anywhere near the beaches. It's like a Ponzi scheme, really. Yeah. With that in mind, um, there's such vested interest, such money, such demand, a never-ending string of demand of people who yes. want to come here. People How are already on their way, remember. Yeah. If we stop them now, they're already leaving... There's people leaving the Sudan now are going to reach the only place they want to get to, the French beaches, to get to the UK. They'll arrive in two and a half years' time. And so, you see, they're on their way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I th um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure, I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed, just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to me, Neil Oliver, and the Neil Oliver Show. OK, first question. Would you eat meat grown in a laboratory? It's a question that seems to divide opinion. Uh, joining me now, though, is Ivor Cummins, a biochemist who feels that we should be wary of such products. Ivor, thanks for joining me. I'm a great admirer of your work. Good to see you there. Oh, well, likewise, Neil. Uh I'm a huge admirer of your work also, goes without saying. Good stuff. Now, to get to the meat of the issue, pardon the pun, <laughs> can you describe for me the reality of lab-grown meat? What are we actually dealing with here? Well, we should probably draw a contrast with the fake meat problem. So the Beyond Burgers and all these things, they're fake meat, and they're made up with refined grains, GMOs, soy, and they're basically the ultimate ultra-processed junk food which has caused most of the chronic disease in the world over the last half century. So they're completely disgusting muck. The laboratory grown meat, it's hard to find out exactly what the harms might be. It's basically mimicking real meat and it doesn't have all of the refined grains and junk in it. But I think the problem with the laboratory grown meat is that animals uh, reared by humans properly with regenerative farming are the best possible way of getting all the polypeptides, all of the nutrients, all of the goodness of meat. And it's important to note as well that the vast majority of paleoanthropologists without question would acknowledge that Homo sapiens grew their extraordinary brains, primarily through scavenging of organ meats and carcasses, and then going on to being the most successful hunters on the planet. So the reason that human species is here is the incredible nutrient density of meat. So if you go to make it in a lab, you may not make a harmful product per se, but there's no way you'll match uh, the incredible value of real meat. And the other problem is that it's mainly being driven based on an environmental climate premise. But if you go to sacredcow.info and look at all their infographics, the problem with actual properly reared uh, animals for meat is grossly exaggerated. And that's even if you acknowledge the whole climate change disaster scenarios, even if you acknowledge them, the contribution from properly reared meat is minuscule. It has no meaning. 
So the whole basis for doing lab-grown meat and this kind of technocracy nonsense has no actual basis in the first place. That's a huge problem. I, it's I've, driven on a lie, and it's for profiteering and other ulterior motives, I would say. When you mention ulterior motive, I, I said earlier in the show, it, it strikes me as indicative of a kind of broader contempt mm. in which we the people are being held by, by those who have some, who are in a position to exert authority over us. There's a, a feeling that, well, that's good enough for them. Why, why are we giving them the good stuff? You know, when we can give them ersatz, imitation, facsimile food. It, it, almost feel, it almost feels like another means by which we, the people, are being put in our place. <laughs> yeah, for sure, Neil. And the beauty is that all of this uh, problem is documented. So from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund through to the World Economic Forum, Club of Rome, and all of these organizations over 70 years, it's all documented and it culminates in Agenda 2030 of the UN. That's also documented. And yes, indeed, they want a much more managed uh, ant farm, is the way I describe it, in the West. China's got a great ant farm. Everyone's under control, surveillance, tracking, mm -hmm. and highly dependent on the government. Mm -hmm. And in the West, I think there's a jealousy uh, looking at that. And dependency, I think, is a big part of this. If you have local healthy meats and vegetables grown in individual countries, it's the best for the climate, it's the best for local self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. you know, and sovereignty. But all of this push is to create a fake food pipeline. And ideally, as we're seeing in, in Europe, the farmers' protests, they want to take away local mm -hmm kind of self-sufficiency hold that, and hold they want that to thought, create Ivan. dependency. So I think that's one of the big advantages hold, of hold. all of the ultra-processed food and fake food and indeed lab food. You create a pipeline where the people are dependent on that over time and they lose their local natural resources and self-sufficiency. Hold that so thought, I, I think Ivan. that's I'm just gonna, one of I'm, the angles here. I'm as just well gonna... as giving less nutrient density and less ideal foods that give humans health and mental acuity and vigor. I mean, we, we know about Genghis Khan and all the horses. They lived, fought on their horses, and they ate their horses when they were short of food. Ivan, I'm just going to bring in. I'm just going to bring in my my guest in the studio here, just to, just to, to hear her reaction to what you're saying here, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. A culture of dependency. Uh, you know, the, yeah. do you think that there there is a, a, an intention here to take people away, l even less agency, less control over your life? and more dependency. You mentioned, uh, for example, just having to register your chickens. I mean, an absolutely ridiculous concept. I assume it's because that once a year or so, they'll decide there's something like bird flu and they all have to be culled, you know. Um, I mean, if you don't register it and they find you've got one, it's a £5,000 fine. You know, when you have stupid, stupid stuff like that and farmers actually being watched via satellite and being fined for um, ploughing their field at a time they're not supposed to be ploughing their field, th this is clearly... Um, uh, surveillance state that they're trying to bring in as Ivor says you know just like China they, they want to be like China and and it's all about control I think. Ivor it seems I mentioned to Jasmine earlier in the show but that it seems paradoxical to me that here in the West where we have wealth we have all this technology at our fingertips and yet the people seem to be and are measurably in declining health. Mm mental, physical and spiritual. How can that be when we, we live in the land of notional plenty and yet everyone looks grey and fat? <laughs> yeah, well, Neil, and you know more than most which are historical expertise, but I'm a World War II buff as well. And the reality is we're three generations since World War II and people have gotten really soft. They've had it so good for so long. We have an incredible safety culture and everyone's terrified of everything. Mm -hmm. So that's weakened them. But the other huge thing since World War II is ultra processed food. So I call it the devil's triad. It's sugar, refined grains and processed vegetable or seed oils. And that's what makes up most of ultra processed food. And that's 60% of UK calories approximately from the BMJ. So our people are poisoned now and they do become fat depressed. 
and much less able to be resilient and to pay attention to their surroundings. I've often said in the morning, if there was magically only meat, fish and eggs and maybe some vegetables available, that was the only food. Within a month or two, the population would be visibly transformed mm. and half of the pharma companies would go out of business. I've, I've run out of time with you, but thank you so much for your enlightening contribution. I will continue to uh, consume your product online. <laughs> uh, a, a fascinating uh, uh, auditor you are in so many areas. Thank you, Ivor Cummins. Yet again, another break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be back in a couple. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So there has been plenty of showers around in the north, all thanks to an area of low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK at the moment, but it will slowly move its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of Monday. Higher pressure does stay close by towards the south and west for a time, bringing some clear skies through the Sunday evening. But those showers in the north and west slowly push their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning, turning particularly heavy across northern parts of England and we could even see some snow across the high ground of Scotland and it will be a chilly night here temperatures dropping into the low single figures and even in the south around seven or eight degrees. Monday starts a bit chilly but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning leaving a drier day there will be some sunshine around but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland and it'll be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd one or two showers around across northern and western parts and perhaps a few bubbling up across eastern parts of England. But there should be plenty of sunshine around. However, temperatures still close to average. Still a few showers around on Wednesday and Thursday, but there are hints of something more settled later in the week and temperatures returning closer to average. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. My next guest this evening is comedian Lewis Schaefer, who by any standards has a fairly radical approach to diet. Uh, Lewis joins me now. Lewis, it's great to see you. Tell me first of all why you embarked on a change to your diet. Yeah. Specifically, you had health issues, did you not? No. I didn't realize I had health issues until I changed, until I lost a lot of weight. And then I said, I, and, then, and then I started to, as I'm losing the weight, I was feeling so much better. But then I started to maintain the weight and, and it all crumbled again. What were the, what were the let's say, the, the complaints, the, the, the health complaints that you had yeah. that you s subsequently have found yourself to be without? Well, let's start from the top of my head. I had full body psoriasis. I had a sleep apnea, which is one of those CPAP machines that cost like 
thousands on the NHS, just like a man free, but whatever. It's, you know, with a. I had to go to sleep and what very sexy. I had, I had, I had frozen shoulder, trigger finger, I had gout, I had plantar fasciitis, I had, um, I had edema, which is swollen hands and swollen feet. I had, um, I had, uh, um, uh, I had erectile dysfunction. You're a fine figure yeah. of a man, weren't you? you were <laughs> I was. I was horrible. But, but so what did you embark upon? Now I'll, I'll say up front. I've been. Yeah. I've been following you on social media because of the photographs that you post of your daily platefuls. Yeah. I do that to be fascinate me. Yeah. So what was the what what uh, diet have you embarked upon? And by diet, I really yeah. mean a way of life. Yeah, a way. It, that's true because people think a diet is just about losing weight. It's not about losing weight anymore because I lost weight the old-fashioned way, which is basically torturing yourself. So what do you eat? <laughs> I eat steak and eggs basically. I am now. I've now for 18 months. I've been raw steak, raw beef, and. I try for raw eggs. I try to eat three to five raw eggs a day. Just the yolks. Yeah. Now, why? That's, why? That's, that's what I eat. That's basically what I so eat. That would be, so that would be a fairly unglamorous that's cut cook, of beef. That's the cooked food that, my, uh, that the woman who I live with. I just, this is me eating the runny eggs. This is not an indication. But that's what I eat. I eat raw eggs. That's scrambled eggs with butter. Mm. Um, that's that's where my girlfriend cooked me some food, and I had to eat it because she was she says she's my girlfriend. <laughs> and why why raw? Why have you not only have you are you limiting yourself to just uh, yeah. just a handful of things? You don't cook them either. No. But because this is what I've been doing this for five years, and after a while, you know, I know enough stuff. But I'm, you know, I know. But ex explain it to me. Why have you got why why raw? Because the human the human species has been cooking meat for for hundreds of thousands of at years. At least. So at why, least. Why would you say that there's a benefit to raw? There's a benefit to raw because it's it's more hydrating because it doesn't kill any of the nutrients. This is everything that I've learned off of the internet. And uh, it doesn't kill the nutrients that are in there, cooked food. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not as chewy. It's just delicious. It's raw is, raw is better after a while. How do you, listening to yeah. Lewis describe this, I mean, it, it absolutely fascinates me that yeah. the man was a catalogue of medical ailments, yes. <laughs> switches to raw beef, raw eggs, and uh, you know, a few other things besides yeah. butter yeah. and whatnot, and he's now as fit as a flea. Yeah, feel the muscle. Feel no, yeah. Oh, yeah, very We're not impressive. advocating yeah. it as a lifestyle choice. Yeah. No, We're not, you know, just... Do not take dietary advice no. from this show. No. <laughs> but what do you make of this? Well, it is so interesting. Story. I mean, it makes me think of Jordan Peterson, of course, who's doing something similar, yeah. and his daughter as well, um, Laura. Laura, um, I'm trying to think of um, uh, also, um, uh, anyway, um, somebody else who does exactly, pretty much exactly the same. So, but it's meat and potatoes or meat and broccoli. There are, you know, people have different ones. And it's steak, not just meat, in fact, it's steak. So I do know people. I also have friends who are raw vegans. I've got two friends that I can think of who became raw vegan, again, because of all sorts of physical problems that they had. And they swear blind that raw veganism has made them healthier. Has made them blind. Blind. Yeah, <laughs> that's, where they, that's where they swear it blind. Is that is that is that you got to give Jordan Peterson a shout out? I, I've yeah. been doing this uh, six years. I've been doing this this diet of only meat, uh, mostly. I, I I cheat. Everybody cheats, but I have ninety five percent of my diet mm. is pla is mm. not is not plants. It's meat, but. Um, I, I, I was heading in that direction. You had Oliver Cummings on the show, and he was a big influence on my on my life. And then you saw, I'm, I'm not the only one. That's why in about in about a year this will not be weird no, at all. No, absolutely. In the interest yeah. in the interest of what we like to call balance, I can yeah. tell you that I've I've got here the NHS diet guidelines. Okay, the National Health yeah. Service, which fascinate me as well. Mm, I'm fascinated yeah. by so much. Yeah. Um, five portions of fruit and veg a day mm -hmm. seems reasonable. Base your meals on starchy foods like potatoes, bread, rice, or pasta. That's anathema to you. Mm. Uh, have some dairy alternatives, such as soy. Now, I, that, I, that yeah. does not sound... Mm. But, no. Well, it's interesting. Eat some beans, pulses, fish, eggs, meat, and other protein. Choose unsaturated oils. Now, that's mm. the very vegetable oils that I think are, yes. are the devil's own yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sweat. Yeah. Uh, uh, and eat them in small amounts. Drink plenty of fluid, six to eight glasses a day. That sounds fair enough. I don't but think you should. The water, the water is one of the worst things. You don't, you don't need water when you're on a on a um, on a, a, a raw diet. 
Did you you get enough in, you get enough in, in the meat. Animals aren't drinking water all the time. You should, so, well, I don't... It, are there any downsides? I mean, I, I, apart from it, it must be yeah. boring. It is really boring. And here's the downside. The downside is people think you're going to die, and people are wishing me dead. And I, I made a mistake. I put the thing up. I put the pictures up, and and people want me. They want me dead because they don't want it to be right. Because they can't believe. Because it involves. They think it's. I'm killing more animals than their vegan diet, which is not true. Mm -hmm. So they want me dead. So if I die, if I die tomorrow, everybody's going to say, "You see, I told you." If I get hit by a bus, they'd blame my meat diet. Yeah, yeah. I, you, you're right. That you know, if people are skeptical, people are entitled to be skeptical about what you're saying. Although yeah. the, you know the, the, the physical manifestation seems to speak for itself, given <laughs> what you were describing before. But as you say, Jordan Peterson and Michaela yeah. Peterson, his daughter, mm -hmm. yeah. for years now I've been reading about how they, they, they have it. If they, if they don't still, they certainly did for a long time. Subsist purely on beef and water, mm -hmm. but salt. Yeah. And that, and, and Michaela, in particular, had a juvenile arthritis. She was serious yeah. suffering in, in all manner of ways. And, and since switching on to this extremely radical meat-only diet, she well, is she is extremely fit, as the, as the photographs that she posts yeah. of herself will, will plainly testify. I mean, at the very least, it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. At the the key. Sorry. The key thing is, is that she started this horrible diet. She's like 30 years old, so she started it when she was. You know, 30 years ago, mm. when it was a... F I'm old enough to remember butter. So uh, my, bo <laughs> my body isn't as bad as that. Uh -huh. And yeah. so, and so l you know, she's obviously... My, my bad health came 30 years, out, you know, to now. Unfortunately, we have to break now, but we will be continuing this food and nutrition-based conversation as we progress. We'll be chatting next to Chelsea Munro from PETA, who says that lab-grown meat is the future because it will help to save the planet. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go anywhere. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this, is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous to well, destroy would our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of primer stave and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. My next guest this evening is Chelsea Munro, the Digital Campaigns Manager at PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, who feels that the move towards in vitro meat is happening and not a minute too soon. Chelsea joins me now. Good evening, Chelsea. Thanks for joining me. Evening. Thanks for having me. As soon as I an obvious question, I have to ask, have you tried in vitro lab-grown meat? Have you sampled it? I haven't, no, and I don't feel the need to try it as since giving up meat, I feel great in myself. Uh, however, I'm really very supportive of anybody who would choose lab grown meat over an animal who's being slaughtered in an abattoir. Are you persuaded that lab grown meat is better for the environment than livestock herds kept in the traditional way? Absolutely. Yeah, to put it into context, it takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. Um, the way that we farm now uses so much water, energy and resources, and it's so wasteful that the United Nations has cited farming as one of the leading causes of climate changes. And it's estimated that this invertebrate meat would use a fraction, a very small fraction of the resources and energy that um, factory farms would do. So it's definitely a no-brainer. It would be so much better for the environment. The reason, the reason I ask, I'm, I, I, I'm looking at um, a study by Livestock Environment and People, a programme at the Oxford Martin School, uh, and it's, it's, up, it's, it's very recent research, and it, it suggests that while uh, uptake of particular forms of cultured meat could indeed be better for the climate, others could actually lead to higher global temperatures in the long run. Now, I would say that it, it, would, it would seem that there isn't necessarily a consensus supporting the notion that lab-grown meat is definitely better for the environment in every case, and, and, that, and that is if a person subscribes to the notion that, that livestock is, is detrimental to the, to the environment in, in any case. But I, I think it would be, I think it has to be fair to say that the, you know, the, the jury is still out on whether uh, it's better for the environment. So there would, have to be, there would have to be better and other reasons for advocating a move to lab-grown meat than, than purely oh, the environmental. There are. Yeah, I mean, animal animal rights is definitely one of the leading causes. Um, currently, right now, in the UK, 300,000 chickens die every single day in the meat industry. We can take cells from animals um, without even harming them, and there's already cell lines available for scientists to use um, for lab-grown meat. So we really could be saving billions and billions of lives um, by implementing lab-grown meat. This drift to this, this technology of creating meat where there was none mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seems fundamentally wrong. Yes, because I, I found myself um, drifting away from meat um, over the last few years, partly because I'm, I'm one who, you know, I find it difficult because I love, I love animals. I find it difficult that, that I would be eating, you know, these little uh, soft furry creatures, um, or maybe not soft furry. But you know, creatures. But at the same time, um, I, I really, if, if I'm going to do that, I would go to vegetables. Um, you know, I'd be pescatarian, maybe just to eat fish, etc. Um, rather than have some kind of, as you say, Frankenstein meat product, which it just doesn't feel right. There's again, there's a sense of control, um, and also, like with the electric vehicles, there are all sorts of hidden costs, hidden ways in which those are harming the environment. And I think that the production of um, processed meat, pretend meat, will have all sorts of ways of harming the environment, which you don't get, I think, with, with animals, personally. To me, the, the, the prime consideration is the, is the people are the people. Mm. You know, I, it, it's the welfare of people. Yes. And there's, there's something profoundly anti-human 
about a great deal of the, mm. the broader agenda of 2030 or, yeah. or however what you want to describe it, mm. that, that people are not being properly respected. Mm. You, yeah. can have your, you can have your, your conversations about whether or not animals are properly treated, but we're definitely, in my mind, drifting into territory where people mm. are not being treated with respect. Oh, very much so. And, and um, as you know, the, one of the co-founders of Greenpeace, Patrick Moore, um, he's recently said that if we get to net zero, half of the population of the world will die. Now, many will say that that's part of the point, that you know, the agenda, the depopulation agenda, if, it's, if it does exist, is to re remove seven and a half billion people from the world. Well, if you know, you can uh, re remove more. Chelsea, can I put that point to you while I still have you? Uh, the, the broader agenda yes. 2030, it, to me, and you, Jasmine was echoing mm. the feeling, it feels anti-human. Mm. Uh, it feels that people are being put into second place or third place and that it's an unhappy direction of travel. Yeah, so actually I wanted to touch back on what you were saying um, a minute ago about sort of it feeling a bit unnatural. but. There is actually nothing more unnatural than taking animals from their environment and cramming them into sheds by the thousands so they can't turn around. And Frankenstein genetic modifications that have been used in animals mm. Um, mm. is, again, it's, it's vastly unnatural. Uh, chickens in the meat industry, for example, they're bred to grow extremely large, heavy upper bodies very, very quickly to maximize profits. Um, their bodies then can't be supported by their legs and they collapse and they have to sit in their waist um, until they're taken to the abattoir. And the waist can give them ammonia burns. Um, and there's just simply no way to ethically or humanely kill an animal um, when their throats are slit and they're plunged into the de-feathering tanks which store them. Um, there is just no way, whether that's a local farm or a farm further away, it's not humane. Um, and I do completely agree that the best diet is oats, grain, and fruits and vegetables, and I completely support that. But if we're looking at um, meat that's, you know, from an animal who's been covered in an abattoir versus um, meat that's been grown in a clean and sterilized laboratory, um, that is definitely the better option. Chelsea, I absolutely respect uh, your opinion and your feelings about meat consumption, I, I, as I do, I, I respect the way that, that so many people express that feeling that, that what we're doing is, you know, is, is wrong. But I, I, for my own part, I absolutely want animals f who are, that are being raised for food to be ethically and decently treated, and I, and I believe there is a way of doing that, as I, as I believe there is a, a humane way in which animals can be slaughtered. But I absolutely respect your, uh, your opinion on that. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's all for the TV portion of the Neil Oliver Show, but stay tuned for Free Speech Nation. There's plenty more extra content on GBNews.com. Ecopreneur Simon Godek will tell us about the powers of vitamin D. We'll hear from Casey Means, co-author of The Good Energy, and I'll also be joined by Davinia Taylor, the former actress turned author and nutritionist. See you there. On Mark Dolan tonight, have any lessons been learned from the Hillsborough tragedy? I'll speak to a survivor. In my big opinion, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. If she was a conservative, she'd have been gone weeks ago. And in my take at 10, whatever happened to Hugh Edwards? This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting.